Okay, greetings and welcome to msdynamicsworld.com's Fall 2013 Document Management Webcast Series. I'm Jason Gumpert, and I am very happy to have you all here with us today for the event. We are fortunate to be joined by Henry Imes, Managing Director at Paystream Advisors, a research and strategy consulting firm that focuses on automation and benchmarking of purchasing and payables processes. Henry has a three-part series planned for us this fall on AP automation and e-billing, and that series starts today with a look at what Henry is calling the road to AP Serenity. Uh, we, also, we invite you to add your feedback and ask questions today, and uh, you can use the Q&A block that you see to the right of the screen to, uh, to ask your questions anytime. We'll make sure to leave a little bit of time at the end uh, for you to ask those questions. Uh, so, without further delay, uh, please allow me to welcome uh, Henry Imes. Henry. Thank you, Jason. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks all for taking some time out of your busy days to think about how you can be a little more serene in your accounts payable process. Um, and we've kept it a little bit fun. Wouldn't it be nice if AP was serene and you didn't have to go through hiring of new staff and the angry voices of suppliers on the phone and your customers saying, why isn't this bill been paid? We sent it to you months ago. Of course, you don't have it. Um, we're going to help you think about that. Um, for the past 13 years, I've been leading an organization called Paystream Advisors, which is focused on financial and procurement operations best practices. Um, and so we um, at Paystream Advisors design um, systems, do business cases, and are like an architect to help organizations automate their purchasing and payables operations. You can see some of our large customers here, but we work with organizations of all sizes. Hey, Henry, um, I don't think your desktop is uh, being shared. Oh, it's not sharing yet. Oh, let me see. Let's go back to make it share. Thank you, Jason. I want you guys to see my cool slides that we put together for you. We get a lot of great data. There we go. Well, we want you to see my beautiful picture first. Um, so um, there you see me. Now, I can't see you, but I'm going to share with you best practices, tips and tricks that we've learned over the years of helping literally hundreds of companies bring serenity to their AP operations. Um, our work is aimed at really helping controllers CFOs of mid-size and large organizations figure out how to bring innovation into their operation. And we're going to give you some insights on some vendors, some techniques, and some best practices. Uh, Paystream Advisors is a research and consulting firm, as I mentioned, and we're based in Charlotte, North Carolina, for just a great place to live. And I hope that you're enjoying a great early fall day. So let's dig in. Our session overview is going to Think about a measuring success of what you might want to do in your accounts payable operation. And I'm going to give you some indicators that can help you understand the metrics that deliver performance improvement. And think about the data that we are in control of in accounts payable. And we're going to be looking at ways to calculate a return on investment. We're going to be looking at some solution provider names that you can consider. And we're going to look at techniques that you can use to automate your AP operation. Now, I'm going to share a little video with you, which gives you a sense, and you won't be able to hear the audio. You remember this one from Oh, well, that's 50 or 100 years ago. The great and powerful odds. And his, the punchline is, you know, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain, right? Because it's scary. And we hear this more than anything from uh, controllers and CFOs, accounts payable managers, say, you know, we want to automate AP, but, well, there's just something holding us back. It, we're not sure about the 
the technology. We're not sure about putting together the business case. And unlike me, when I was first learning to drive, I had never purchased a car. So when Uncle Frank took me down to look at the used car lots, I needed somebody to go with me. Well, that's what we're trying to do today. We want you to come along with us to watch it watch in and take a look inside of what's behind the curtain of companies that have gotten the serenity in AP. And the main thing that we've learned is, guess what? They've gone paperless. They've gotten rid of the paper tiger, which is killing their business. Um, and, you know, we, we study this from a, well, almost a human level as well. In our latest survey of AP professionals, we hear that Many of them say that they feel underappreciated, they don't expect to be um, promoted, um, and we, we sort of wonder if you're a controller, are you waiting for your staff to sort of wake up and say, okay, we're going to automate accounts payable. Well, they don't know how. And so it comes from leadership. We need some leadership to show accounts payable how to do this. And they haven't purchased the car before, and they've never been to Oz before, and boy, it's kind of scary. So let's talk about some metrics that we'd like to think of. Of course, you want to go paperless, and you want to go to electronic. How are we going to do it? Well, what we know is that the companies that do this don't need to hook up 5,000 vendors to go electronic because, of course, 80% of your invoices are only from handfuls of your suppliers. Therefore, the best-in-class companies are able to do it by just automating well, around the top 500, 400, 300 suppliers. And we don't need to boil the ocean and go to every vendor to do it. Exception rates is another key thing that we're going to talk about today. Invoices per accounts payable staff. Now, many of you are from smaller organizations that have one or two, maybe three accounts payable professionals. And you know, if you look at your volume, typical paper-based operation can handle between 8 and 12,000 invoices per person per year. The only way you can improve the efficiency of accounts payable is by going to a paperless process. The companies that do this are able to jump their efficiency in accounts payable three to four to five times. So organizations that have gone through automation, paperless, are able to get to 30, 40, 50,000 a year invoices per staff. Wow, that's a pretty big change. And in this environment where it's getting harder and harder to hire good people who want to do manual paper processing, because, well, frankly, students coming out of school today aren't expecting that their lives are going to be managing paper when they grew up with mobile devices in their hands. Um, it's harder to hire good people in accounts payable. They're disappearing. Um, and so we've got to think differently of how we manage that department because, well, frankly, we're not going to be able to have any staff to do the work. And, of course, we want to think about what can we do to get electronic invoices in your department. So with that, I want to turn it over to Jason for our first poll question. Where are you in AP? in improving the process. So Jason, let's bring up the, the first poll question and see what the audience right. is thinking about when it comes right. to should... I'm going to open up the first poll. You should see it on the right side of your screen here. We'll take uh, just a minute to start gathering those results, and then uh, we'll turn it back over uh, to Henry. Yeah, we want to we understand about priorities. What are your priorities in your operation in terms of thinking about how you're going to um, to move um, to this. And how, we want to help you think about it so that we want to think about empowering you um, for measurement and think about how do you build uh, a business case to, to move forward. We know that most of you have thought about this over the years, and obviously given the title of what we're talking about, many of you are going to be working on this process. Um, so help us understand where you are. And then we can tailor our comments for uh, the results. And I'm just going to try to bring up those results. Are you seeing those now, Henry, uh, on the right side? Uh, if not, I can read them off to you. No, let's read them off. I don't see it on my screen. Okay. Hmm. So the uh, 
the results are from the folks who um, responded, only 5% call it a low priority. Medium priority has the highest number of votes um, with uh, uh, 12 votes, and then six votes go to uh, high priority. So about half as many for high as, as medium and end. Only a couple okay. for low priority. Good. Well, we found the right spot. Everybody's here in the right place. So if you make me back up for center, I'll show yep. my slides again. And um, we'll go back to sharing uh, sharing the materials. So for those of you who are said, yeah, this is a medium or high priority, well, this session is really aimed for you to help you. For those of you who are low priority, we want to help you think about why this can be a high priority or should be a high priority. And a theme I'm going to talk about here is about empowerment. We, we know that we need to, in order to do this, the big barrier that we frequently hear is we don't know where where to start. Um, and typically, there's some barriers around that. It's like, well, we're not necessarily feel empowered to do it. We don't know how to get started, and, well, we don't have budget. These are the most typical reasons why these kinds of initiatives don't happen. Um, so let's start with the, the business case. Um, now, we're going um, we're gonna to let you through um, – a response here. If you will tell us if you want a copy of our Excel template to help you build the business case, and you can let us know later in the Q and A. But we're going to talk about how you analyze the options, build a business case, and then uh, define your project. So the first thing that you've got to do is start with this core idea. Okay, if we did something, if we wanted to move on the path of serenity, what's what's it going to look like after? So what's the benefit? Of course, anybody who in analyze wants to know what are you going to do and what are going to be the benefits of what you do. The first piece that we believe is very important here is defining what's the current state of affairs. And one of the weaknesses that we typically know is that, well, we because we're in it every day, we don't necessarily need to define it for somebody else. The reality is the CFO and the owners of our organizations generally don't understand accounts payable. I don't understand what it is that we do every day. Um, and so we need to, well, give them a flyover in education of what it is. Um, and the way, best way to do that is to compare yourself versus other organizations of similar size. And so we call that a peer comparison, right? So how many invoices are they measuring? I'm going to give you some ideas about that. Let me start with the idea statements. The problem with accounts payable is, is the problem – we have a staff turnover. Is it that we have 30% of our invoices are being paid, paid late? Is it that we can't handle seasonal fluctuations? Is it that the approvers, the staff members and the rest of the organization, spend an inordinate amount of time chasing down invoices? Is it lost invoices, missing invoices, duplicate invoices, duplicate payments? Of course, our senior leadership doesn't understand all these items, but we've got to help them understand what the issues are. And then measuring those and showing them what it costs them and talk about long-term goals. Don't we want to go paperless and AP? Well, of course. That would, be, that would be serene. But what's it going to mean for us? What are the savings that we're going to have? So here's an example that we do for a client when we help them understand the cost of accounts payable. And this is something very basic that you can do. So what we've got here is a cost allocation model of taking the staff, we can put them into full-time equivalence model. So in this model, look overall on the right here, we've got 5.3 people total in accounts payable. We broke up their jobs in six buckets. How much of them spend time opening the mail, entering the data, Managing the exceptions, then customer service, vendor master management, payment, and oversight. This is the management part. So this organization, it totals up to 5.3 people. And then we say, all right, well, let's do that. Let's assign a cost to that. How much did each of those cost? So AP overall, this is a great thing. A lot of organizations don't even think this far. Okay, we've got 5.3 people. It costs us $300,000 a year to, do, to pay the bills at our organization. Okay, that's the kind of number a CFO gets, right? Now, 
we can drill in on this and we can start saying, well, what is the cost per invoice? What does it cost me to process mail, enter data, payment? Wait a minute. Those things can be done without paper. Those things can be done in more automated ways. If we did them that way, we would eliminate 34,000, 108,000, perhaps 28,000, or we would lower them. This is a quick way of the way Paystreams thinks about building the business case. And always don't forget to include the overhead. What's your overhead factor? 25 to 35% seems to be the number. Now what we figured out along the way is the people that are able to slash the cost of accounts payable, typically between 40 and 50% by moving through a series of steps, and I'm going to show you here. Um, here's what they do to get there. They centralize. That means all invoices always come to accounts payable. They use front-end imaging. That means that they scan invoices the minute they come in, and that there's never at the lost invoice. If it came to accounts payable, it's in a front-end system. They use purchasing cards to pay low-value invoices and eliminate the paper that comes in. So if we can give purchasing cards to field staff, they can pay for an invoice on at the point of sale, then we have eliminated an invoice, and we also cut down on the work for accounts payable. And of course, adopt electronic invoice. Well, that works great. And if you're IBM and Walmart, electronic invoicing is, well, typically 70, 80% of their business. But for many of us, it's harder. How do we get our suppliers to move electronically with us. How much opportunity do you have to move to electronic invoicing with your suppliers? It depends. If you're buying from Granger, CDW, and Federal Express, certainly they can provide you electronic files, electronic invoices through a network or a portal. Everybody has suppliers like that, but it may not be 80% of your invoices. It may only be 20%. What do you do for the rest? We're going to talk about that in a minute. The next four here relate to a little more detail of what happens. Automated workflow is the tools that take the imaging and route it around to the approvers. So if we're receiving invoices at Central AP and scanning them, then we route them out to Mr. John Cipriano. When he's approving an invoice, he gets an email saying, John, you have this invoice. It needs to be approved. He clicks on the link. He sees the invoice, and he puts his accounting string on it. Or he says, this invoice doesn't belong to me, or we didn't receive this invoice. But all of that, of course, is happening electronically. That's what we call the workflow business logic. And the electronic invoice practice here is that, well, and many times it's, it's useful to use a third-party company to go in and engage our suppliers because they do that as a living. In other words, their business is connecting with suppliers. So when you hook up to a network, you may find, and there's one that comes to mind, there's a couple that come to mind here, um, to do this, um, they'll help you get those suppliers hooked up to you. So uh, Metafile has systems like this, Esker, Bassware, Bill, Zap. Um, these kinds of companies will help you get your suppliers onboarded so you don't have to do it yourself. Accounts Payable Serenity is, well, we want to make AP do what it does best. And one of the things we know that AP generally doesn't do best is vendor onboarding, communicating with suppliers, knowing who to communicate with. And the problem is that we are typically dealt a hand that's too short for us. We're given the wrong cards. And the minute the, what's wrong is essentially we don't have the right contact information of who the suppliers are. We know the suppliers name the remit address, but we don't have, no, we need to speak with Bob in accounts receivable or Susan in customer service. We don't know the names of the people that we need to interact with to get them to start changing the way they do business with us. So I've given you some ideas about analyzing the options, and I'm going to come back on more of that. Let's talk about building the business case. So the basics are how many invoices do you have, how many payments, what does it cost you to process? I've given you a clear look at how you might build that. A very simple analysis that takes your staffing and assigns it against the invoices and breaks it up into functions. The reason we broke it up into those six functions, well, Serenity is built on 
getting rid of the data entry and the paper. Those two things allocate about 50% of an accounts payable process cost. Remember earlier on I was talking about 10,000 invoices per staff per year. The organizations that jump to 30 and 40,000, they do that very simply by getting rid of the paper and the data entry. That's the biggest benefit that they're looking for. A simple savings opportunity to help you think about costing. So if you don't know your cost for invoice, the standard number to use is about $7. That's what it costs most paper-based operations today. $7 of fully loaded, and that's just the direct labor, the fully loaded direct labor, not even including the overhead costs of um, IT or facilities, things like that. Now, electronic invoices can cost you about half that, and um, the average cost of making a payment could be a dollar to um, six bucks. So you got to think about, do we have a serenity opportunity around how we make electronic payments as well? So with your project, you're going to research a best in class. That means if we did automation, what would it, what serenity would it bring? Well, it's going to lower our amount of invoices that come in that are lost. It's going to lower our amount of exceptions. And so I want you to use our tools so we'd be delighted to help you find the right performance measurements for your organization to, well, communicate to the executives. In order to gain executive buy-in, we've got to share your baseline business and your goals of where you want to take the business. So let's use that in the um, structure of a, a PO-based invoice. Let's talk about exceptions. Here's what we know. When we think about uh, benchmarking items, we think about the average processing time for invoice receipt to approval. Um, for lagging organizations, it's typically 23 days. Cost per processing an invoice, as I mentioned, was around $7. And the percentage of invoices received electronically, which we define as re not requiring any data entry. That's an electronic invoice. An electronic invoice is not, however, email in PDFs because it requires someone in your staff to key it in. Um, percentage of invoices that have a discrepancy. Well, typically, we're looking at 16%. That means, yeah, that's right. One out of five or six invoices has some problem, and it can't be posted on the first pass. And I'm going to share with you why that's important in a moment. And, and then percentage of discounts captured. How many of you capture? the number of invoices that you can't pay on time or missed discounts. It's an easy one to capture. Um, hey, we were offered this discount. We didn't get it because it's a great business case driver to take to a senior manager and say, you know what, these invoices, we couldn't capture the discounts because we didn't approve them fa fast enough. It wasn't AP's fault. It's just that the organization, various things happen. We'd love to rush those through, but we haven't gotten approval from the departments. A great low-hanging fruit. So, Jason, let's bring up our next poll and talk about where our audience sees the benefit of moving paperless. All right, I'm going to bring that up in just a moment here. Okay, the new poll is up. You should see it on the right side of the screen. What is the biggest benefit you expect, you expect from going paperless in AP? Yeah, I'm curious about our our audience here. You know, we had the most of the audience was interested in in researching. They were 18 months out. I think they really at the right right place. Now we want to talk about well, if you do it now that you've seen some ideas, what benefits do you think that are going to resonate best in your organization? Which are the ones that are going to get the organization to get IT moving to get the CFO moving in the right direction. Which ones are, are is it going to help you? These are the kinds of things we want you to to think about. How do you how do you start building that business case? Okay, we are uh, collecting the responses here. It looks like it'll be another few seconds until uh, the Wonderful. final results are in. Um, I can uh, just give it one more second here. 
Now, while we're uh, doing this, I, I want to let you all know that I'm, I'm willing to take your questions um, at any point during the session and, and answer, ask a question. You're going to use the Q&A tab and type it in. Um, we'll be aggregating these, and we'll come back on them at the end, but I may stop during the session if you have a question specifically about something I'm talking about. So please bring us your questions. We frequently... Okay, so, uh, yeah, go ahead, Jake. Oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the results oh. are in here. So um, for the, the lowest, uh, well, let's start with the highest. So the highest uh, vote getter was eliminating manual entry um, with uh, 11 votes. Next was improving invoice visibility and reducing uh, lost invoices. Uh, that was second place. Third place was speeding up invoice processing. And the lowest was reducing staffing challenges, which uh, only had three votes. Great. Wow. You certainly got a lot of opportunities there. Um, let, let's go back to the uh, yep. let's go back to the slides, and we're going to think about some of these uh, tactics that we just talked about here. Wonderful. Thank you. There we are. All right, so I've given you some ideas. Um, and let's talk about things about the innovation. And I, I want you to think about um, bringing innovation to your business. And I'm going to use another little video clip here uh, to help you think about driving innovation in your business. And well, you may remember this movie from the well, the 90s, Billy Crystal and Bruno Kirby, uh, uh, down and out. Middle agers, well, things aren't going great with the family, and so they head out to Montana to learn how to handle cattle uh, in this movie called City Slickers. And here's the advice from our friend Curly, the well, the cowboy from the past. Oh, hang on, so it didn't come up just quite right. Curly tells him, what's the one thing? That's what you've got to figure out. Here's the, here's the one thing for you. I don't know in your business, in your serenity journey, what the one thing is. Um, you're going to have to figure that out. But we're going to give you a few things to think about over the next few minutes. And I want you to think about which ones of them may be the best for you. There's different paths for different organizations. So for those of you who are thinking of 18 months out, we certainly want to answer this first one around electronic invoicing. Because time and time again, we speak to organizations and say, yeah, our number one goal is to get more electronic invoices. OK, great. And that's a great goal. But what does it mean in terms of your transformation? And how much is that really going to save you? So electronic invoices are great because they come in electronically. It doesn't necessarily mean any data entry for us, or does it? In other words, if you get an electronic invoice, what are you going to do with it, and how can you post it to your accounting system? Do you have a tool that's going to allow the file to come into Dynamics, maybe through an EDI feed? Is your IT team going to be able to support that? Um, with that, then you can build a plan that shows your paper-based invoices going down and your electronic invoices going up. The reason this is important is because each of these has a different cost. An electronic invoice could cost a dollar fifty, whereas a paper one might cost you seven bucks. How fast are you going to manage the transition? Certainly, it's going to help you with the business case. But the other piece is thinking about a strategy of how you're going to eliminate invoices and where are you going to get those invoices from? Which suppliers are going to provide you with electronic invoices? It requires you to do some modeling to think about your vendors. And a simple way to do that is to build a 
a table that shows all your supplier invoices in reverse order in terms of volume. So you take your top volume. Who's your top volume supplier now? By invoice count, not by dollars. Go to the little table. Show your top 25. Show your top 50. I think you'll be surprised in those results because you'll see in the top 25 and the top 50 what percentage of those of your total invoices come from those. Now, empirically, you know that. You know who your top volume suppliers are. The next question is, which ones cost you the most time and effort related to discrepancies? So say you're this mainstream company that has 16% of your invoices have some discrepancy. What's a discrepancy? Well, let's define it for us. The discrepancy is something that's an exception. And we want you to quantify. The road to serenity means you have to quantify the cost of managing the exception. Now, this is a little bit of a cost accounting exercise, but if you can figure out what your exception rate is and figure out how much staffing you have based on managing exceptions, you remember from that prior slide, well, then you'll know that if I can drive that down, I can use my staff more efficiently or reallocate my staff to do something different. Here's what we generally know. About 40% of accounts payable staff time is managing exceptions, invoices that won't pass in the first, first post. Something's missing. Could be something wrong with a vendor invoice, price, quantity, unit of measure, the classics. Or it could be something related to receiving, receiving mismatch. Or it could be that the supplier is calling us and saying, where's my invoice, and we don't have it. So with this, we're going to say, all right, what's your, your goal? What kind of goal are you trying to get to? And what I was showing on the previous slide is that or the innovators are able to do this between 2 and 4% of invoices having exception. And serenity is when you have that, because, of course, this drives down the cost of managing the telephone and the increase from the suppliers and the angry departmental approvers. In order to do this, you've got to develop a little bit of a simple model. You can't run a report, typically, that's going to, in dynamics, that's going to help you tell you why you have an exception. You can against POs, but that's only part of the story. If you have 50% purchase orders and 50% non-PO, then you're only going to have half the story. What we suggest is that you do a simple root cause analysis, do a, a, a hand tally, and have your AP staff for a week track where those exceptions come from. Every time they can't post an invoice, mark it down and write down what was the reason that it wouldn't post. And then this will give you an exception rate. You'll know how many invoices you posted for the week. Say you posted 300 and 25 of them have an exception. Well, then you'll be able to calculate your exception rate and the reasons. And you can do your root cause. The important thing to think about here is that we know that exception invoices costs typically two to four times more than a regular invoice. So if your average invoice cost is, say in this example, $3, that hides it. The average hides the exception cost. In this example, the clean invoices were 2 bucks, and the exception ones were around 5 Now, that's a great impetus for change, given our organization understands the metrics and say, if we move to a serene environment, one that's automated or paperless, we know we can drive down the cost of managing those, and everybody's going to be much happier. So we now have removed another obstacle. Now, another big obstacle we always hear is that we don't have any budget for doing anything in accounts table, and we never will, frankly. Well, the good news is this is changing. Um, it used to be, of course, that we had to spend many tens of thousands for IT resources, but the first thing we want you to think is you may not need technology. You may not need to purchase any technology. You may be able to do this with a third-party solution provider or with a cloud-based uh, technology system. So many innovative companies today are offering a low-cost process change that requires zero capital budget and only operating budget. In other words, you pay for the invoices that you process through their system, but there's very low upfront costs. So 
recently we helped a client get started with a solution provider in this market for a dynamic customer using a system called BillZap, and they charge $1.59 per invoice to process through their system, and the setup costs were about $7,500, so certainly no big budget. And the IT staff took just about two days of work uh, facilitated by an outside contractor to actually integrate the system. So it wasn't a lot of time of IT, um, and it wasn't a lot of cost, and the organization is saving $4 an invoice. So what's holding you back? So how can you build that business case? Now, I mentioned earlier that we have a business case tool that you can download and, and get from Paystream Advisors. We also have something that can help you figure out your cost per invoice. The simplest way here, and I'm giving you this because we know that, well, this is a financial dis discussion about getting resources assigned. And every organization has priorities. We have to help prioritize. We find that most of our organizations, in order to get started, had to put together a pretty sophisticated argument here. And look at what we got, basically. Number of AP staff, the cost per year. Then you allocate up for soft costs. That's the kind of summary way you're going to think about the model I was showing you earlier. And then what's the cost with the software as a service, e-invoicing technology. How much is a subscription fee? How much does it cost per invoice? Well, all generally these services come down to a cost per invoice. And you can say, okay, well, if we're going to reallocate some of our AP staff to do another important accounting function, maybe it's reporting or budgeting, analysis, um, then we're going to lift them away from doing the paper-based process. Um, and, of course, cost per invoice is the easiest way to do this. So we see this uh, as a way to use our cost per invoice calculator, and that's on the uh, Paystream Advisors website. Just type, type in cost per invoice calculator at Paystream, and you'll come up with this simple tool. In about three minutes, you can figure out your cost per invoice. What we typically recommend that as you develop your strategies, that you put together a, a strategy and design your business case, then write some requirements, and if you're going to talk to a bunch of solution providers, you may want to write an RFP and help you with the, the um, elements to, to put together to the business case, to get the approval of senior management, and then do a pro forma of what it's going to cost you in the future to show how much your organization is going to save. Now, that's the basics. And we talked about moving forward in a serene environment. So how do you find the right solution? And we know that many of you are out thinking about this right now. Paystream has scored a bunch of vendors, and the good news is that all of our research reports on the solution providers are available for free on our website. So you can download details about the leading solution providers in the marketplace today and find out what they do and how they do it to understand if they good fits for you and your Dynamics system. All the ones that we have provide solutions for uh, Dynamics. They're integrated with the Great Plains platform, DAX, um, all of the, uh, the leading you know, platforms. And even if you have an out-of-date Dynamics platform, most of these solution providers have already integrated with 30 to 40 of these kinds of systems. So hooking it up in most organizations is fairly simple. Even if you have a complex environment with purchase orders, receiving tickets and other uh, integration elements. Paystream scores these vendors on our 20-point uh, radar chart here, and um, we score them to under, underscore where they're strong and where they're weak, and depending on what you're trying to do. Is it mobile approval? Do you want to have customized reports? Do you want electronic payments? Which are the elements that you want? Now, when I think about the transformation journey, to moving to serenity, I want to summarize the key points that we talked about today before we move into your questions. The first elements that we want you to think about is doing your research so you can develop a vision. Where are you trying to go with your organization? It's hard to know when you necessarily haven't been there before, but I've given you some ideas. I think the key words are 
paperless and touchless. Serenity starts with eliminating the paper, eliminating the headaches of lost and missing documents. We're all finance people, and we, at the end of the day, we want the data. Invoices that are received and approved locally, then sent to accounts payable, will never give you serenity because you'll never have a full vision of where all the invoices are. Suppliers calls you up. If it's at a department's uh, business office or sitting on Billy Bob's desk, we'll never know that. So as I mentioned early on, the best practice is to have a central point of receipt of all invoices. 95% of the time, that's the best practice. There are exceptions to that. One of the exceptions is for a distributed manufacturing business that is receiving a lot of invoices at a field location when the items are delivered. A couple of scenarios we see this in food service or direct materials being delivered to a factory plant. Sometimes it's okay to allow that business to have its own scanning operation and scan those tickets or receiving documents or proofs of delivery at the location. There's a hybrid approaches, but most of the time centralizing invoices in one central location, whether it's your location or using a third party to open and scan your mail, is the best practice. We call that last component managed invoice processing. That's where a third party company opens your mail for you and maintains a mailbox, a post office box, scans the invoices and give you, gives you the images and the data on those invoices so that you're out immediately out of the paper business entirely. That's an increasingly popular choice. Uh, Sixty plus percent of organizations that are using Dynamics are moving into those scenarios today when they automate AP. In other words, they're not trying to manage their own imaging operation internally. The reason being is that managing an inbound scanning operation, although it seems simple to scan the invoices, has a little more complexity to it than might be viewable of the naked eye. Consider this. We have multiple sided invoices. When do we scan the back and the front? We have invoices that are sometimes 30 pages long and some that are one pages long. What happens if an invoice gets submitted twice? How do you manage that process? The folks that do this for a living as an outsourced service provider, typically doing this domestically, by the way, this is not India outsourcing. This is typically a local organization with a post office box in a city nearby that's opening the mail, doing the scanning. Now, here's where it gets fun. What they really are doing and where they're adding most of the value is the data at capture and extraction. Unless you're a company that has more than 100,000 annual invoices, it's difficult to afford to purchase the data extraction or capture technology, commonly called OCR. Software is expensive. Increasingly, we're seeing it offered as a software as a service or in the cloud model. However, it still requires you to do the scanning. And if the scans don't come out well and need to be rescanned, how is that managed? Who's going to manage the scanning when you're on vacation or the person's out sick? So it requires a lot of backup. When a lot of folks look at this, they say, yeah, geez, the cost of letting somebody else open the mail is 30, 40, 50 cents an invoice. I can't do it that cheap with my staff. I can't do it and own all those scanners. So that's why 60% or so are increasingly using this managed invoice service option. Now, we've talked about accounts payable. How does this connect to what you're trying to do with your goals around purchasing and payables? Is there a strategy in your purchasing department to do more electronic purchase orders or catalogs, e-commerce with our suppliers? And how does that play in? Do we want an electronic requisitions forms that people can do to create a requisition? Do we want a electronic form for somebody to use for uploading the quotes and receipts that they have? So this is where we bring together the concept of accounts payable serenity 
with Perch to Pay Serenity. And combining these two into a single platform can be quite powerful. The next element we talked some about is how are you going to interact with your suppliers? How are you going to get them hooked up to your system? How are you going to define how you can collaborate with suppliers? Do you have a plan for discounting their, in, uh, their invoices? Are you going to give them some incentives or penalties to try and drive their behavior? Transformation is also based, of course, on your culture of your organization, your process, and the information data that you use. So I talked early on about benchmarks, metrics. What are the metrics that you're going to use to drive success? We believe that basics are, and I've given them to you, cost per invoice, percentage of electronic documents received, exception rates, and percentage of invoices received electronically. We start with those four. Those are going to be the core drivers that drive down your cost and improve your feeling of well-being about the accounts payable process. Here's some um, solution providers that you might want to consider in your journey. And we have a number of here listed here, depending on where you are in the marketplace, whether they're end-to-end -end providers or electronic invoice providers, electronic payment providers, and dynamic discounting. This is not this is not exhaustive. We have more data at PayStreamAdvisors.com, which I'm going to give you a quick look at here in a sec. Um, we have something called the Solution Source, which can give you a listing of specific providers you might want to consider in your organization. Here's our website. And you can learn more about some of these solution providers here in the solution source. So here's a, an electronic payments provider, and we have a little video briefing on them. It's a quick way to understand what they do and how they do it. Um, where one of our analysts, in this case it was me, was giving a, a brief overview of the company, what they do, and how they do it. Um, this is part of our solution research vault. So um, these are the things that we want you to think about as you automate and bring serenity in your AP environment. With that, I'm going to turn it back to Jason to take your questions. All right. Thanks so much, Henry. Um, one question that has come up a few times, maybe we could uh, – kind of answer it generally here is um, accessing the slides that you've been showing today. Um, should people uh, maybe send you an email if they have questions about that, or did you have another uh, another idea on, on how they can right. get more Drop of this information? In. Yes, I've talked about a couple of things. We certainly would like to have you have the slides, so you can drop me a line, and I will email the slides out to you, of course. Um, I've also talked about the cost per invoice calculator that I'd like you to have to use to help allocate your costs in your accounts payable operation. We've got a nice template for you to use to help think about how to bring, um, to do the cost per invoice calculation. Um, so that's that's exactly right, Jason. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And just as a reminder, um, uh, you have Henry's uh, email address there and, and phone. Uh, you can use the chat or the Q&A blocks um, that you can either bring down right now and maybe we'll bring back the uh, the home the home screen so that people can more easily see that when I do that now. Um, so everyone's had a look at the contact information there. I'm going to bring us back to our sort of home panel here. And, uh, yeah, please do enter your questions now. We have a, a few minutes left. Henry, thanks so much for uh, for the great presentation today. My pleasure. Um, um, I, uh, no. I see um, you know, a general question that we have is about how long does it take to show a return on investment on serenity initiatives, automation initiatives. And increasingly, it's coming down. Um, the time period that it takes is typically three to four months in many smaller organizations because the cost of setup can be so low today. Um, if you purchased a software system that's going to uh, hook on to the side of your Dynamics platform, um, you could be looking at uh, paybacks in the 12-month period if you have to purchase licensed software. The software as a service models generally 
have a faster return on investment because there's less upfront cost and you're paying uh, per, per access to the system on a cost per invoice basis. And we're seeing those prices range from a uh, dollar thirty-five up to two dollars per invoice to manage in the automated environment, depending on the number of invoices and key factors like do you require purchase order matching, line item matching, and what data do you need uh, brought into your uh, electronic system from perceptive software, Metafile, or Esker? Okay, great. You mentioned uh, out, you mentioned the um, the outsourced invoice scanning option, and uh, just curious uh, when you go when a company goes with that option, what are some of the, the key integration points that they should be thinking about in terms of working with that kind of provider and given their existing systems? Sure, um, the, there's uh, three key integration points. Um, one is if you have purchase orders that those purchase orders are uh, shared with the managed invoice processing provider so that when the invoices come in, they can find that purchase order number on the invoice. The first thing that they do in their process is, mm -hmm. does a PO number exist on this inbound invoice document? The second is sharing the vendor master file. Now, that's pretty easy, and that can be done typically uh, once, a, once a month, uh, once a week, if an organization may not need to have a direct feed to do this electronically every day because the changes of vendors may not be that high. Um, and uh, lastly, um, the payments file. What is best practice here is that we provide a file so that the suppliers have access to invoice status through a portal. So the suppliers can log in and have access directly to the system um, to find out where is their invoice. They can do their own inquiries um, by putting in a, key, a combination of uh, data, an invoice number, supplier number, dollar amount, invoice date, and they can get access to, hey, when was that invoice and when will it come in? That was a, that was a good question. So three key integration points, purchase order data, vendor master data, and payment data. When was this invoice paid? Because we want the suppliers to use the portal to find out information about invoices that were paid. And we all know that 60% of calls that come to accounts table are inquiring about when have I been paid or when was I paid. Well, many times, the majority of those calls, the invoices have already been paid and the invoice payment is on its way. Okay, so we had a question from Don. Thanks, Don. Uh, how important is it to increase the number of PO and contract invoices? Oh, it's a good question. We like that. Good insight. Here's what we know. Serenity can be driven higher. Can you be more serene? I think you can. Um, by getting more purchase orders and contracts uh, out of the whole process. In other words, I think what we see is pretty common is that once companies get an idea of using these kinds of solutions, they see a great benefit of doing more of the approval work on the upfront. That way when the invoices come in, they're matching against something and they're, we're increasing the touchless rate. So here would be an example. Say you have a, a department that's allowed to purchase uh, legal services and they need to, they could just buy the legal services, um, which is typically what they're doing today, but how about in this stead, we say, hey, why don't you guys open up a requisition for this in advance? And the system will spit out a requisition request to the law firm. And it says, lawyers, when you bill us, bill us at this address, email us here, or send it through this electronic portal to us. And use this purchase requisition number when you invoice us. That means when the invoice comes in, we're mapping against the purchase order and all we need to do is go to the approver and say, was, were these legal services approved on, are, are they, were they delivered on time and to your quality? Do you want to pay the bill, in other words? And it speeds up the process. The same thing can happen with contract invoices. We may not have a PO for those contracts, but we can have a contract number, and we can spit out a contract number to the supplier when we buy from him. Mr. Supplier, we're buying from you under contract 1234. When you invoice us, send your invoices to this email address and put this contract number 
on your invoice. That was what's going to speed the process for us to match it up and get it paid. Thanks, Don. All right, let me make a last call for questions here as we sort of near the top of the hour. Uh, Henry, I had I had one more question here, if uh, if you don't mind. Um, you know, you talked earlier about some of the, the motiva motivation uh, elements and, and job satisfaction and AP professionals. Um, can you talk at all about the the transition that an AP professional or a team might have to make when there is a, a new e-invoicing or AP automation solution um, implemented and some of the transitions that do have to take place? Uh, in terms of, like you said, I mean, moving, uh, moving people are changing their responsibilities uh, as part of that. It is a part of it, and you know, we have a very human business. Accounts payable is a human, uh, human process, and it will be for a long time to come. So, typically, organizations that move through the serenity process are thinking about putting the right people in the right job. Of course, what you're trying to do every day. And with um, moving to some kind of automation, it's going to change the work effort. If you do it right, you're going to eliminate, as I said, about 50% of the work, which was manual and key. Some of those tiers, people that are really good at keyboard entry, may not make the transition. They may not be great employees for accounting to maintain because they were great at key entry, but they may not be great what you really want, analysts or budget management people or finance people that can run reports. We think the organizations that have those opportunities can find, obviously, other places to utilize those staff, whether it's in the receivables uh, groups or doing other functions of the organization. Most staff, though, are quite adaptable and really quite excited when they're not doing that kind of work. and are now freed up to do and work on more of the well, the analytical elements that we really want as controllers and CFOs of these organizations. So yes, staffing changes are an inevitable, uh, inevitable part of the process. Um, and we typically like to recommend that our clients create new job descriptions for the roles and allow the employees to self-select. What works best for us is when we create a job description we help the client, we post that job description for everyone to see. Here's what it's going to look like in the future. Which job would you like? And some of them want the, the, the role of opening the mail. Some of them want the role of doing the, the repairing of the data that comes from the capture engine. Some of them want, so we let them self-select um, to find the best fit. And uh, hopefully they can have an input on where they want to move with their organization. All right. Well, thanks so much, Henry. I really appreciate, it. again, you, you taking the time to present today, and we're excited for uh, for your upcoming events as well. Wonderful. It's a and great opportunity to see you all. We look forward to hearing from you. And let me know if you have any questions. I'm just posting your email address one more time in the chat area so that everyone can see that, henry at paystreamadvisors.com, and on Twitter, you are henry underscore I, I believe. That's your, right. Your Twitter handle. Great. That's me. All right, well, thanks, Twitter everyone. Handle. Yeah, thanks everyone for uh, for attending and be on the lookout for for more sessions coming up this fall and have a great day. Bye-bye.